I'm opening. We have an eye, part of a nostril, two teeth. Hmm. One of the teeth has a small cavity. Close call, folks, but I think we got here just in time. Presented by Maria Menounos and Kevin Undergaro. This is Anatomy of a Movie. In-depth discussions and breakdowns of various movie titles. And now that you've seen the movie, let the dissection begin. Ah, welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining us for another Anatomy of a Movie. This week, brought to you by Maria Menounos' latest new New York Times bestseller, The Every Girl's Guide to Diet and Fitness. Thank you, Maria. This week, we'll be dissecting Edge of Tomorrow, the latest summer blockbuster uh, starring Tom Cruise and Emily Blunt, uh, directed by Doug Lyman, and scored by a very ve special guest, Christoph Beck. Very Hello. Thank you for having big, for joining us in the studio. Appreciate Truly you being here. Truly my pleasure. Thanks. So we're going to talk about the movie. We'll break down a few of bits of it. Then we'll talk to Christoph about his career and uh, a bunch of other things that which we can try to glean out from him or to get out of him as best we can. But get in the ready. meantime, <laughs> I want to introduce the panel to my left here is Marissa Serafini. Hello, everyone. We also have Sarah Stratton. Hi, guys. And in the booth is Phil. Will you be joining us? Uh, not today. Okay. Just from <laughs> so the booth. Just, be just the doing booth. that. So the first thing I want to know is overall impressions. And I'd like to start with Christoph, uh, or Chris, as he's known by all the friends back in Canada. Uh, <laughs> um, when you first saw it, with, I assume you saw it with Temp Track or no? I did see it with Temp Track, okay. but the, the, they hadn't spent a lot of time on the temp, and uh -huh. it was mixed so low that I thought... It was buried? Into it, it was, it was yeah. buried. For example, all those battle sequences, yeah. uh, the, the four or five first repetitions of that mm -hmm. scene on the beach... The music was mixed so low I couldn't even hear it. So wow. I thought oh, that's an interesting choice to just play a completely like <laughs> cinema verite. But uh -huh. a, but it was just because they weren't really comfortable with the temp uh -huh. and and it was just kind of there, do, doing its job uh, in minimalist fashion. So in that form that you saw, what was your initial response to it? I mean, how did you come to it when uh, you when what did how did you receive it? I loved it. I mean, mm -hmm. it's. Um, I was talking to Sarah earlier before the show. I often don't get to see the movie before mm -hmm. I take a job. Um, now, this movie being the type of movie that it was, yeah. the thought never entered into my mind that I wouldn't do it. Um, but it was still an enormous relief to see the movie for the first time and to uh -huh. see just in what good shape it was. Oh, that's great. And it's pretty different from the the um, the movie that we see in theaters today. But the, the, the core of it and the mm -hmm. story of it and the Tom Cruise amazing performance of right. it was all there to see. And uh, I was just really, really pumped up. Do you mind telling us what that running time roughly was? That first version? I don't even saw? know. I okay. don't even know. I, I think it might have even been shorter really? than what we, what we see now. So yeah, I know there was a late. minutes running time now. Is that right? 113. It might have been a little shorter. I know they, yeah. they, they played around a lot with a few different sequences, mm -hmm. long, complete sequences in mm -hmm. movie, out of the movie. And they ended up putting um, a whole like eight, nine minute sequence mm -hmm. back in uh, pretty late in post production. So mm -hmm. I, I I wonder if it was if it was shorter or longer mm -hmm. when I saw it. And you liked it, loved it, and initially, right away we're going, yeah, I want to score this. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. He's yeah. like, I'm, I'm on yeah. board. Right. I'm happy. Yeah. We're uh, good. <laughs> I mean, it's it's a great it's a big step for uh, for me personally. Mm -hmm. um, I've I've done a lot of movies, most of them comedies, mm -hmm. and you know, Hangover being a huge one. Correct. Um, and many others like it. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, for me, this is a, the. First mm -hmm. opportunity to a, a big summer tentpole that wasn't a comedy that right. was uh, in a genre that I happen to love. I, I love sci-fi. I love um, especially this movie, which mm -hmm. is, you know, kind of a, a hard sci-fi mm -hmm. time travel mm -hmm. movie. With um, aliens. Taboo. Uh, totally. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you got to give props to Tom Cruise for yeah. keeping the torch alive, the, mm -hmm. the sci-fi torch mm -hmm. alive to some extent. Um, so, yeah, it was incredibly exciting. I didn't know you were a sci-fi fan. That's great. All right. Let's get to Sorry. your impressions there. All right, overall impressions. I have to say that I'm joining on, I feel like, the constant review of this movie, which was everyone is so pleasantly surprised. Right. And I am, I really, really enjoyed it. Um, I love sci-fi. And some of the movies we've seen lately haven't really been living up to what I have expected from them. Um, <laughs> Transcendence. Uh. <laughs> okay. Sorry. But I think that, Tom Cruise's performance, how they approached time in this movie, how mm -hmm. my favorite component was that they did make the reliving of this day feel long, feel like a struggle, feel like there is ups and downs. They gave an emotional impact to how many times he was reliving that. Mm -hmm. And to me, that really sunk in and how much emotional crossover there was where I felt like his relationship 
with Emily Blunt had had all these other moments that we didn't get to see, mm -hmm. I really enjoyed. And I thought the timing, the pacing, everything was put together really well. Um, and it's a movie I look forward to seeing again. So well, you said The happy. Longest Day was interesting because it was released in America on June 6th, which obviously is the uh, mm -hmm. uh, anniversary of D-Day, and I thought they wanted to make it the l feel like The Longest Day for real. All right, so Marissa, crazy. what did you think? Yeah, and you know, you just mentioned D-Day. It mm -hmm. felt like a storming of Normandy when they landed yeah. on the beach, I but mean, I, I nice really, choice. yeah, I really did like this film. I, I myself am a sci-fi by a fan too but I'm a big fan of non-linear stories because mm -hmm. I feel they always make the audience think in ways yeah. and that really if done well it'll keep audience still engrossed in the story still trying to figure it out all mm -hmm. the characters everything yeah. that's going on and I thought it was really brilliant how they edited and just kept the story going even though time was resetting yeah but every time you see it progress a little bit forward mm -hmm. and i thought that was so well done and the only time we can really see time move and use effectively is in film is in photographs we can see things how they change over time mm -hmm. and i felt this movie really played with that and even going back yes like sarah you mentioned the emotional struggles that we can see we can see hu humor in it as well mm -hmm. like how many times he's getting frustrated and because he's doing it over and over again but he's still it was just so well done and mm -hmm. i love non-linear and it was yeah great i i, I agree i i love non-linear films that jump in time and space they're always fun and i thought this was great at that and i you didn't even it, a lot of times Tom's behind this curve because he doesn't know where he is and then sometimes he's way ahead of us because we don't know he's taken a hundred I've done this I've killed you a hundred times and we go oh it's been that many mm -hmm. we don't even as an audience we don't know that so I and that how they play with when they do expand the scene from the beach to whether it's the farmhouse how right. they don't always take you back to his first experience in it mm -hmm. like for instance when we do get to the helicopter scene they could have played that off as, oh, it's their first time there each time. It's, oh, yeah. it's their first time at this location. It's the first time. But sometimes they bring you in introducing like, oh, we've missed that they've been here yeah. so many times. And that's one of the things. I'm sorry. Did you have No, we're right time? ahead. I, the other thing I wanted to, because how do you do that as a composer? I mean, first of all, you've got over well over 100 films to your credit. So how do you keep from repeating yourself, especially in this movie? <laughs> how do you? What's the technique? Well, I'll just what's, talk about this movie. Okay. Um, it, we talked a lot about how to approach the repetition. Yeah. And um, I do that in a number of ways. One, one of the ways is at certain key moments, not all the time, but at certain mm -hmm. key moments, we play the same or almost the same music mm -hmm. for the same scenario. It's that coming you're back to the mold. same point. Okay. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's a little bit of a change of color mm -hmm. or sometimes it's a change of key to make it feel like we're going a little bit forward. Mm -hmm. But you really feel in a few key spots the repetition of the music, which reinforces the repetition of what you're seeing, mostly in the in the comedic moments. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm doing that, um, but also in in um, one of the main themes of the movie, um, I, I I wrote a tune that was eight notes mm -hmm. long or ten notes long, and I presented in the piece. Okay, here's the first note, mm -hmm. and then I start over. Okay, here's note number one, note number two, uh -huh. and then I do three notes, and then we sort of build on the oh, theme that mm -hmm. way, which which is it's a little bit of a. Uh, intellectual conceit mm -hmm. I'm not sure anyone you know your average person good. seeing the movie I don't know if they're gonna oh interesting hey, wait, interesting that. mirroring of the the structure of the film and the structure of the tune but that's that was the idea so did you have to map it out as you're no um, uh -huh. it wasn't quite that specific okay. it was really more of a feel our way through Again, experiment yeah. I, mean, uh -huh. I was on this movie for a good five six months so is that so long that is long that that's is unusually long. long for me I'm usually about on a movie about half that length of time uh -huh. But it really gave us time to experiment. Um, you know, I wrote a lot of different versions of a mm -hmm. lot of the key scenes, and uh, that was a constant source of discussion. You know, mm -hmm. how do we play against the repetition? Mm -hmm. um, you know, because because when even in the movie when things repeat, there's something different about the scene. There's mm -hmm. a forward motion in the storytelling, and how much of that do we want reflected in the music? Is that workshop approach mostly because it's kind of how Doug works, or is that because of the nature of this particular piece, we had to do it that way? I don't, honestly, I think, way. honestly, I think it's the nature of the business okay. and the job. It is so difficult to talk about music. Yeah. I mean, I, I could play a piece of music for you, mm -hmm. and you might only be able to tell me if you like it or if you don't, and you might not even be able to tell me that, mm -hmm. or you might be able to go into some detail, and mm -hmm. maybe you, you mm -hmm. have... Um, some ear training or whatever mm -hmm. um, but it's just um, I, I don't even, I've seen this quote attributed to lots of different people um, but it goes something like 
talking about music is like yeah. dancing about architecture. I'm sure you guys have heard that before. <laughs> it, it's, 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 yeah. it really is true in this case. So, mm -hmm. um, and, and with Doug, there is a bit more of a, uh, I'm not sure what I want, but I'll know it when I hear it type right. of a thing. So mm -hmm. there was a, certainly an initial struggle mm -hmm. in the first month or two, um, trying to get inside of his head and trying to shed some of my, uh, my old habits. And there's also, I mean, I don't know this, but I'm guessing, at least in my mind, uh, my ear, if I hear something, it's different than when I hear it and see it at the same time. Did you, I mean, do you always have to see it while you're hearing it to really get the full effect of it? Um, yeah, you know, I'm not, I'm not making records. I'm making yeah. scores. So, so it's it, really all about that. Yeah. It's, okay. It's, um, it's totally picture and story driven. It has to be. Okay. Now, occasionally I can take a step back and turn mm. off my dialogue track and mm -hmm. just enjoy a piece of music for what it is, a piece of music. Sure. Um, but that's, you know, I can't let myself get seduced by that too much. <laughs> I have to really think about, okay, but does this do what it needs to do for this mm -hmm. story? When you say you create versions and you like, you present them, do you have a a place where your gut's at and you're trying, or are you trying to really accommodate the director's vision? Um, well, well, both. I mm -hmm. mean, I, I'm always trying to accommodate the director's vision. Mm -hmm. Occasionally I will have um, ideas that go counter to that. And mm -hmm. in which case, multiple versions is a great way of presenting that. You know, okay, here's the way you want it. But look how, how do you like it? Yeah. <laughs> but now check this out. Maybe this is, this is the opposite of what you asked for, but maybe this is better. Mm -hmm. And um, I, you know, most, most f filmmakers, uh, sure, they get married to ideas, but they genuinely want to make the movie as, as mm. good mm -hmm. as they can. And um, they're, they're open to that sort of thing. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. And you said five to six months on this. And when were you brought into the process? After filming had been completed? Or yes. while it was, oh, okay. After principal filming had, had been completed. Okay. There were a couple of little reshoots that they did uh -huh. here and there during post. Um, but uh, a few months really after they finished shooting. Okay. Yeah. They had a very long post on this movie. They had a very long a year. production. Yeah. They kept resetting for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. They had to do it, you know, hundreds of times. Yeah. What were you saying, sir? Oh no, I was just saying that in general, I feel like this movie from concept, like in post production, pre production, everything. It was. It took a lot, but there was a lot put into it. Yeah, yeah I let's, mean, let's give the backstory of it, how it became what it is. It was adapted from a 2004 Japanese novel called "All You Need Is Kill" by Hiroshi Saku. Oh, Sakurazaka. Good luck. Sakurazaka. <laughs> Good luck with Sakurazaka. that one. Sakurazaka. Hopefully, apologies to if I mispronounce it. If I did, uh, it was uh, bought in late night two thousand nine by Three Arts Entertainment. Instead of pitching a studio to make the film and buy the rights to make the film, etc., they decided to do a spec script. But they brought on who they were Dante Harper, mm -hmm. and which uh, he wrote a script that ended up on the blacklist. And in two thousand ten, it was purchased by Warner Brothers. And it was purchased for a lot. It was yeah, purchased it was like for three, over. Well, I want to say I think it was over. It was over well, a million. Parts from one million to three million. Mm -hmm. I don't know wow. if anybody knows, but I'm sure we'll find out. And then it was proceeded to be a little bit hacked. Yeah, up. well, this, and this is what <laughs> so a lot of people lot have of asked me. In. They wanted me to go into more detail about how things go into the screen. So we're just giving this as an example, which is not, well, well, it is indicative of most scripts in Hollywood. Let's just put it that way. So it was purchased in 2010 by Warner Brothers. It was revised in 2011, was revised again by, uh, it was a Joby Herald uh, to fit Tom Cruise's age because at the time he wasn't on the script now he became on the film okay six months after that or excuse me six months into filming <laughs> Lyman discarded two-thirds of Harper's original script brought in Jazz Butterworth and John Henry Butterworth and they were hired to rewrite screenwriter Simon Kingsberg take over after that uh, eight weeks before filming it was replaced by Christoph McQuarrie <laughs> so this wow. is this is common and yeah. uh, and uh, even though um, Dante would did the original script he's not credited because so much of it was changed so the uh, final uh, uh, credit goes to Jez and John Henry Butterworth and Christopher Court. That would be so how go. it happened. That's how wow. it goes. And I'm and, and I didn't know any of that. Yeah, yeah you didn't? Oh, okay. No. So that's step how it goes. after step after step. And they, they didn't even production. finish the, they hadn't finished the writing when they started filming. So yeah. they were still yeah. writing it as they were filming it. I think, I think, if I'm not mistaken, Chris McQuarrie has worked with Tom on a few things. Yeah. 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 No. So lucky and you so get to come in, and that's all kind of dealt with. Well, <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, you know, it's uh, it's still there's still quite a bit of uh, chaos uh, mm -hmm. uh, around the project on, yeah. on a big project like this, of course. Um, but yeah, that was all you know, water under the bridge by yeah. that point. Mm -hmm. And you're still trying to figure out what you got after you filmed it. It's like, all right, what do we really have here? <laughs> yeah. So now you you said you um, when you started on this production, you struggled with the tone of the film. How did what did you do to overcome that and get started? Um, really just a lot of writing and rewriting. Mm. Yeah. Um, and, and then there was one particular point about two or three months in when um, I had made quite a bit of progress, but there was still some obstacles creatively somehow to me, you know, 
finding a tone that that pleased everybody and mm -hmm. by everybody that was Doug and Tom at that point. <laughs> Doug was in, in Doug was involved with the the scoring process by that point. And it was actually the suggestion of um, one of the music executives at Warner Brothers that just take two weeks off. Like, we don't want to see you for two weeks. Mm -hmm. And just go write music, turn the picture off, and just write music. Thinking about the character, story, whatever. And I was thinking, uh, I don't know. Is that really going to help? I don't know. But it sounds fun. I, yeah, I don't have to see you guys for two weeks. All right, cool. I'll go do that. Um, and uh, that was a bit of a breakthrough for me. Mm -hmm. I think I wrote really only three pieces during that time, but all three ended up in the movie. Mm -hmm. And one of them ended up being uh, the solution to a nut I was trying to crack mm -hmm. with the comedy, how to play the comedy. Yeah. I mean, I, uh, I've done, I, as you pointed out, a ton yeah. of movies, a lot of them are comedies. I feel like I'm the comedy expert, mm -hmm. but this movie was, the humor was obviously incredibly important. Yeah. And you guys all mentioned how, how refreshing it was and something unexpected in the film. Um, you know, to have to have the right touch yeah. with that was was really important, mm -hmm. um, and things went you know a lot smoother after actually after that uh, after that. So two weeks it was off. the so-called break or whatever. Yeah, that what allowed piece you to was there? Yeah, that's interesting. Um, I I actually um, the piece as written was supposed to be in the end credits. I don't know if they use it. I, uh -huh. I I don't think they did, but it is the last piece on the soundtrack. Uh -huh. um, and, it, and that material also appears in the helicopter scenes. It's kind mm -hmm. of a, yeah. almost like a, a, a march feel mm -hmm. to it, where the low strings are just kind of pounding away. Mm -hmm. um, and it really plays to his, um, you know, I don't give a crap kind of attitude by that point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like he's just over the whole thing, like whatever. Uh -huh. And so it's, it was sort of a bit of a forcefully apathetic march. <laughs> 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 That's how it's an adagio, forcefully <laughs> exactly. apathetic, you know, whatever. Well, it sounds better yeah, in Italian. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what type of, when you were looking at this film, like finding these little inspirational points, was there any style of music that really you drew from or held your ear or any instruments that you really felt propelled your inspiration? Um, nothing in particular so much as... Um, Doug's really pushing me to try th try things in a very unconventional way. Mm -hmm. okay. um, and that led me toward th this being a futuristic mm -hmm. uh, uh, film with um, industrial overtones. Those mech mm -hmm. suits are, 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 you know, they're, they're real. They're not CGI and right. they, they feel real in the movie. They look great. And mm -hmm. so somehow um, get some of that industrialization and, and, and mechanical metallic mm -hmm. type of vibe in the score and um, the way we did that was through electronics and synthesizers and spending quite a bit of time mm -hmm. um, making custom designed sounds that we can then sprinkle a little bit of orchestra uh -huh. mm -hmm. around well, but there was the, that was the underpinning that was the, the underpinning I, I would say the underpinning is is synth based right yeah uh -huh. is that interesting for you because i mean you're a classically trained musician and kind of yes. this influx of how technology graduate and how of yale university ladies and, gentlemen. Yeah. <laughs> and like how like the synthesizer how all these you know kind of interesting sounds are coming into play now does that is that a new challenge you had to like learn and no, kind of adapt because, to? No, because I was into that oh, you know, right. probably before I, I studied <laughs> classical. I mean, I remember convincing, okay. in high school, convincing my mm -hmm. music teacher to let me take home the one synthesizer they had and mm -hmm. then just make homemade recordings with it, you know, as a 13 year old. Wow. So you were lucky you were ahead of the curve on this one. <laughs> I've, I've always been into electronic music and um, uh, pr the production side of things. Mm -hmm. I mean, I would. I would work a paper route as a kid, and then my dad very kindly offered to match me dollar for dollar so I could go rent nice. like a four-track recorder and make Thanks, dad. horrible 80s love ballads, <laughs> you know? But I was really always into the production. I loved recording my own stuff. And of course, as you pointed out, um, in f the contemporary style of film scoring mm -hmm. is, incorporates a lot of production techniques yeah. and electronics. It's not just put some nice microphones up in front of an orchestra and go. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's very involved. And I think that uh, uh, because I was so interested in it so early, that, that, mm. that that's an advantage. Yeah. And now it's like people want everything. It's like they want the synthesizer yeah. at some point. But also, we can't leave we out the piano. Get the strings and in there. Like, Where's the oboe? We want, we want everything. Well, isn't yeah. isn't that's a sort of a kitchen sink mentality? Yeah. But isn't that the case for the entire sound picture mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. films? You know, yeah. they're getting so loud, and so there's no there's mm -hmm. no quiet in movies anymore. Do you have? Do you More start finding those times? They are allowing people allowing them. 
It is difficult. Um, it takes a brave filmmaker, yeah, especially to in today's climate, it... with a Hollywood film. I mean, if yeah. you're talking about indie films or or foreign films, that's a whole other thing. But, yeah. um, you know, you'd have to be very secure in your movie yeah. to do mm-hmm. like a castaway. That's right. Mm-hmm. To right? Let Where it the just entire sit. hour and a half middle part of the movie has no score whatsoever. Mm-hmm. And it's just all about Tom Hanks' performance. Yeah. When you yeah. see a movie like that, is, does part of you ever be like, oh, but if there was music here, it would be nice. <laughs> Not when it's as well it? executed <laughs> as that. I mean, if, if the movie didn't work or yeah. if somehow there was a scene where Tom mm-hmm. Hanks' performance was not quite as strong as the others mm-hmm. and you'd be like, okay, maybe a little music would help here. Mm-hmm. Um, but as a concept, I just really appreciated yeah. the cool. elegance of it and the simplicity mm-hmm. of it mm-hmm. just to say, okay, we'll play the beginning and the end and just this time on the island and we just want the solitude mm-hmm. to, to be the main thing we feel, not you know this syrupy orchestra of right. strings telling That's you to feel wall sad. To wall, exactly, yeah. mm-hmm. manipulating yeah. them crazy. But you talked about being unconventional. And so how would you, do you approach it in terms of the themes, you know, some of your characters, like Rita has her own right. thing going. So yeah. did, was that specific? But that's about it. Um, yeah, that's what know, I was wondering. Did, was that, obviously it seemed like a specific choice. We're not going to go that route. Right, definitely. Okay. Great example is the scene where Cage finally becomes like a super soldier. Right. And after doing this Normandy yeah. style battle, dozens, hundreds, however many times, he finally gets to the point where he can really kick ass in the battlefield. Yeah. And they kept saying, he's Superman now. He's Superman now, they being um, mm-hmm. Doug and, and, yeah. and the other filmmakers. So in my mind, I'm thinking, you know, like the Indiana Jones theme. Horns and, and, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So I've done like eight or ten things. And he's like, no, no, still too conventional. And finally, was like, okay, forget about the whole idea uh-huh. of a long line melody. And I created some orchestral effects and sampled them and processed them, distorted mm-hmm. them. Um, and basically... At one point, after doing going back and forth on a lot of these sort of heroic, mm-hmm. not quite heroic versions, Doug said, you know, why don't we just forget about superhero? What if he's just like a punk rocker? What if he's just like a rebel? Mm-hmm. And he just doesn't care anymore. So that's what ended up in the movie. Uh-huh. A kind of very aggressive, uh-huh. almost industrial, um, sampled orchestra, uh, hybrid type of thing. Uh-huh. Hard to describe. Well, I think that feeling carries through because that's how I would describe him. Like if someone came out of that movie being like, oh, Tom Cruise comes out as, you know, the glorious figure, mm-hmm. I'd be like, no, it is. It's that it's a little bit darker. It's a little mm-hmm. bit more of uh, a so, frustration. Yeah. But he's getting dragged, kicking and, kicking and screaming. Would, yeah, because yeah. he's a reluctant hero. He's dra- he's from a goes from a coward to a hero, but he's reluctant pretty much all the <laughs> way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, he does it for her more than anything. Go ahead. Do you enjoy composing for the storytelling aspect of a film or more for the character development of a certain person? You, I think they're approach? one and the same. Yeah. Um, I, it's, it, they're one and the same. I think, that, I think film scoring is storytelling through music, and sometimes you have to think about it on the macro level, mm-hmm. um, and you think about the overarching story, and other times you take it scene by scene. And that's when you can really get more specific with what a character might be thinking at a particular moment. Um, but those are all decisions, you know, whether to do one or the other musically um, that are constantly talked about between mm-hmm. me and the director. And we try different things. And so- sometimes they have a very clear idea of what they want to do. If there's a scene with two characters having a conversation, but they're thinking very different things, maybe they have different agendas, the music has to make a choice. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. that choice affects the flow of the story. And so... Um, those are the types of decisions. It's not. It's not. I. I consider those to be kind of in the same category. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And so, was your was your most challenging part of this to try to get away from the convention? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. And and to f- to find the right sound mm-hmm. that uh, that rang true to Doug's ears of something that mm-hmm. that was very original. That so that, that, really that I that I still you. yeah, yeah. The, 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 you know and. Also, it's important that I still like it too. Yeah, exactly. So, so it was. I mean that that was that was the the hardest part of it. Mm-hmm. You know, to put it colloquially, the mm-hmm. movie kicked my ass for six months, <laughs> and and you know Sounds my like ass started to hurt. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> so, um, but uh, I would I would do it again in a heartbeat. That nut, so that's yeah, amazing. no, I, I would do it again in a heartbeat to get yeah. a chance to work on movies of this caliber mm-hmm. with filmmakers mm-hmm. of this caliber, mm-hmm. and if. If it's you know four times as much work as my other films, that's okay. I'm ready. There you go. Now, yeah. now you, obviously, we talked about how you orig- it first came to you and what, what, what version you saw. Did you have you seen the finished version in any form? I, I actually have not. Okay. I'm, I'm a little embarrassed okay. to say. No, it's all right. It's all right. Uh, the circumstances. You, no, I've worked on you, it more than the first exactly. Long time. So, but, now, <laughs> normally, as a film composer, you 
did see the movie twice, like in its finished mm-hmm. form. Mm-hmm. And the first time would be when they finish their sound mix. Yeah. And they invite everyone in to come in and make their comments. And they have a few more days to make final tweaks. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm usually at this playback. Mm-hmm. And that's when I get a chance to suggest the music might be too soft, too mm-hmm. loud, or... Or if any of the powers that be in the room have any issue with the music, I can be there to help solve problems. Right. Um, so I get to see it there in, I would say, 99% finished form. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then there's usually the premiere. Right. In this case, the final mix was in London. I had just gotten back from London after mm-hmm. spending two weeks there recording and doing my own music mix. You know, I, I, I wasn't going to get back on a plane right. and go go back for a two-hour meeting. Sure. And, you know. You're like, I, oh, I was this is too long of a plane. Six so. months I started. <laughs> well, uh, I think well, I can be you, done right uh, now. Well, from when you first saw it to that point where you'd seen the 99% version, <laughs> how uh, had it changed for you? How, was the feeling still there? Was it, was it those Were those initial reactions still part of it, or were they? Well, heightened? I didn't I didn't actually yeah. ever get to see it. Oh, I, I thought you make it back. I misunderstood yeah, that. I'm saying normally. You, yeah, I misunderstood that. This you know, was beca- the exception to the rule. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Be- because I'm based here and the post-production was over there. Right. No, um, I, I didn't get it now. Yeah. I thought you had no been problem. there for that, but not for the next one. And, and normally the, yeah. the, the second time I get to see the finished product is the premiere, premiere. and in this particular case, the, the premiere was in New York and it was part of a kind of a crazy f- mm-hmm. uh, stunt for the fans yeah, that involved jet setting right New York time London zones and right like yeah New York London and, New- and Paris mm-hmm. all the same day yeah. and by the time they got to New York that was the last one it was midnight yeah they on the edge they, of tomorrow they, well that was the idea right <laughs> yeah. they they did their red carpet and mm-hmm. they went they came out and they introduced the movie and then they all went out to dinner <laughs> and so I'm like okay I could go out to dinner with Tom Cruise or I could see, see the this movie. movie that I've already seen 600 times yeah. <laughs> so I can go to dinner yeah. so I how still, was the dinner it was supposed it, to be it, a really it lavish was great. Party. it w- wasn't really lavish it oh, was okay, pretty small yeah. um, and it was basically thinking? just the filmmaking team maybe oh, okay. you're thinking of a different the other event one. it was the rap yeah rap party so that was just the executives and the filmmakers and, and some of the cast um, so I never got to see it there either mm. and uh, I've been so busy lately I haven't got a chance I was going to take my son it's my really wife good. was like he really wants to see it I'm taking him so everyone in my family has seen it but me mm-hmm. so <laughs> <laughs> one day one day soon I'm going to see it in 3D IMAX you're, okay. you're going to see it and you're going to be like wait this is totally different <laughs> <laughs> to, you know do you ever get notes from your family after they've actually seen it in a movie <laughs> like you know no no <laughs> um, I, you know the only I would say the only person really qualified to do that in my family would be my wife yeah uh-huh. and um, you know she's she's uh, definitely a tough critic uh, and yeah. that's why I love playing my stuff for you her you have to she's, you need someone like that w- yeah. when she says you know what that's great I love that it yeah. happens pretty rarely so yeah. it really means something mm-hmm. um and uh, she doesn't, you know, go into, oh, I don't know about this cue. Mm-hmm. Could you have you gone to A flat mm-hmm. instead of A? Like, whatever. <laughs> Nothing quite like that. So she doesn't have, throw any bouquets, yeah. but when you yeah. get them, they're pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. Has she, she said music? that lately? She is, she's a, com- a composer and okay. a songwriter wow. as well. Mm-hmm. Um, my nine-year-old daughter is a violinist. Uh, and a pianist. In fact, she played a couple of pieces on the Frozen really score. Nice. I brought her to sit with the violin section, wow. which was Probably great. Very happy. About so I predict in a few years I'll be getting notes from her. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, uh, what have I done? <laughs> but well, if it's good for your daughter, then you know it's good for the yeah, rest of the com- yeah, uh, young girl community. Was there any piece recently that you've done that they were really wowed by, or like? Oh, you mean my family? Mm-hmm. Um, Frozen, I guess, mm-hmm. um, for my daughter in particular. Mm-hmm. Um, my son said to me after he saw Egypt Tomorrow, I said, so did you hear any music? Did you pay attention to any music? I said, I, we've talked a little bit about music and how it works in movies and how if the, if the movie is really good, it's okay to not remember the music mm-hmm. and it's okay to not focus on the music, just be involved with the story. Mm-hmm. Um, so he was like, I didn't, I, you know, I really liked the movie, so I didn't really get to hear much of it. But uh, definitely heard a couple moments that were classic dad. <laughs> <laughs> How old is your son? He's 13. 13, classic oh, dad. Yeah. So he's he's heard a few of my scores, I guess, and uh-huh. some of my isms uh, mm-hmm. shown through. Mm-hmm. They have a musically involved family. Yes, very much. Uh, my wife is a great pianist, and, and we, our living room is basically a music room. And um, there's just a lot of music being played in mm-hmm. our house all the time. We have like a little, almost like a band room mm-hmm. instead of a living room where anytime someone feels like it, they can just sit in front of a drum set and play or something like that. So we play, we play family band every once in a while, reenact <laughs> Partridge Family. The next Jam film. Session. Oh, that's Jam way before your familiar. time. <laughs> no, I still got Partridge Family. I know that stuff. I wanted to get you, because we brought up Frozen a little bit, mm-hmm. you have done, your repertoire film is, ginormous yeah. you guys can go on his website there's like 
literally over 30 films and i just don't even understand how you have time for this (laughs) crazy yeah Yeah. it's crazy um but i want to talk a little bit about how you do choose projects and how because i think i miss your love we've seen frozen we've seen edge of tomorrow completely different genres completely different working environments what makes you sign on to a project or what do you find interesting or what compels you to join? Well, honestly, piece? usually what gets me to sign on to a project is a job offer. <laughs> um, it's, it's definitely now post frozen. Let's mm-hmm. say I have, I am enjoying a little bit more freedom mm-hmm. to pick and choose, but even then it's difficult because yeah. um, it's very important as you guys know, and I probably discussed careers in Hollywood are built on relationships and, so I have to I have to really give priority to any director I've worked with who wants to work with me again, mm-hmm. um, especially ones I like. Um, and so um, you know whatever their next movie is, I'm doing whatever it is. Um, and it's uh, it's so it's it's difficult to to really pick and choose in that mm-hmm. way. And and prior to Frozen as well, um, without a, 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 an amazing credit like that to have, um, you know you're at the mercy of what more, you're more at the mercy of of what the people who hire mm-hmm. composers are intending to do and whether they want to hire you than you are just yeah i think i'll do that one that <laughs> one that one and that one um but avoiding being typecast mm-hmm. is something that i'm always thinking about and um you know maybe um uh, after doing a whole bunch of comedies mm-hmm. um i'll let my agents know hey you know i'm getting a little bit sick of comedies can we do point. something else can, can we do something else can we look at some other options you know I don't mind taking a pay cut whatever mm-hmm. and we try to get creative about ways to mm-hmm. to break out of that and you've done it I mean we were talking yeah. earlier but I think you've avoided it crazy Thank you. stupid Thank love you. I mean yeah. that, that, it's not frozen either well so. yeah. I find this sad, amazing I'm gonna repeat it again because I think it's incredible he has the highest grossing R-rated comedy with the hangover mm-hmm. and now the highest grossing animated film like Typecast. I, I don't see it. I don't see it happening. <laughs> Edge of oh. Tomorrow. Things are happening. Why does it back here? Yeah. Yeah. And your music definitely goes, covers so many different demographics as well. I mean, you have Frozen with the younger kid um, demographic, and then you had Buffy, which yeah. catered to the teenage, and then you had the adults with Hangover. So you, your music covers so many different audiences, mm. and I think that's amazing for any composer. You can be more well-rounded in that way. But despite not wanting to be typecast, do you have a favorite? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I, I want to do things I've never done. I want to do a horror movie. Although oh, nice. I, I worry that, I mean, depending on the type of approach they want to go with right. the score, I could right. have pretty splitting headaches by the end of the day <laughs> listening to this crazy, noisy stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I'd love to do... Uh, you need like a, a beautiful horror story. Ma- yeah. Maybe. Maybe <laughs> one with some lyricism or or, mm-hmm. or um, a, a romantic love story. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I've done a couple of those, but it'd be nice to do another one. Um, but, um, you know, I, I will say this. I've done a lot of comedies and, and there have been times in my career when I was really sick of doing mm-hmm. comedies. But... Um, they have mercifully low amounts of score in them, just mm-hmm. in terms of a pure labor standpoint. Um, Edge of Tomorrow has twice as many minutes of score as your average comedy. Wow. So it's it's a lot more work. Sure. Um, but, uh, but, you know, like I said earlier, for, for the right project, if I get yeah. excited about something, the work, you know, it doesn't matter how much work it is. I wanted to ask you about USC and Jerry Goldsmith. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I, I love his work and he's been around. I mean, he's talk about a career. But geez. Well, what mm-hmm. was that experience like? What was it like working with Mike Post and, uh, you know, getting set up to do Vampire and all those things? How- sure. Um, well, Jerry was uh, only tough for one year, mm-hmm. and that was the year that I was at USC. Yeah. And he taught my class. Um, one of my classmates, uh, Marco Beltrami, is very successful as well um and he was in that class and there's three or four other really successful tv video game Uh composers that come out of that class jerry was amazing mainly because of um his sense of how to make a lot out of a little Mm. he can um he can construct an entire piece of music out of a three note motif for example and and he would show us in his pieces how that's that's all related it's almost you know like the way beethoven would have been a whole 10 minute piece out of three notes yeah. most famously in the in the fifth symphony sure. um so it really gives um his music a cohesiveness uh-huh. and a, a, a sense of a journey from beginning to end because it's all related and i i take that very seriously mm-hmm. when i when i do my stuff too i'm always thinking about that you mm-hmm. know all right it's time for a new idea here now 
before I actually dive in and start, oh, this is cool, this isn't uh-huh. cool, I'm like, okay, is there something else from something I've already right. written that I can rework in some way just to give that it could all. inform this piece now to keep it some exactly sort of continuity just to give it some connective yeah. tissue mm-hmm. yeah um and mike was amazing too i i worked with mike as an intern mm-hmm. after my year at sc uh-huh. and uh very different approach to <laughs> yeah. uh, to scoring for, to jerry mm-hmm. mike was the most efficient composer i've ever seen mm-hmm. first of all master of the catchy tune i mean yeah. some of the 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 um, the themes you've written are so iconic now mm. and they're a pleasure to listen to even if they're Long 20 years old you don't know. I mean yeah, among, exactly. among yeah, dozens of others exactly. um, but uh, I remember the first day of my internship I sat down to watch him do this he was scoring an episode of LA Law mm-hmm. and he at the time he was just writing pencil on paper just mm-hmm. sketching out ideas and then handing it off to someone who would go to the computer and mm-hmm. make it all sound nice <laughs> but he, he would be finished scoring the show in less time than it would take you to sit down and watch it from beginning to end without stopping. What? Wow. Yeah. He, he would have maybe, let's say, What's six. What's savant like? It's like? It is. <laughs> it is. Talent. Five or six pieces of music, let's say, in the uh-huh. whole show is not that much music. And each right. one's maybe 30 seconds, something mm-hmm. like that. So he would just fast forward the next spot, watch it once, and I'll just get an idea in his head, 30 seconds, a minute, and then you're writing it down, writing it down, writing it down. Okay, great. Next. Fast forward the next bit, go. I was like, wow, that's amazing. <laughs> that's just amazing yeah. to see someone who's so dialed in to wow. a job to be able to do that. Under- this is like passing. Yeah, yeah. I like get a song stuck in my head yeah. for like three days and I'm not <laughs> able to like break out of that. I feel like if I wrote music, I'd be like, so the whole movie sounds like one thing. Mike was also great in the room, like when yeah. he was presenting music uh-huh. to his clients. He really knew, he knew how, how to, to put on it? a show. He knew how to put on a show. He was, I remember, I, I still don't have the balls to do this with my with my clients, but he would make them listen to every, well, the important piece of music mm-hmm. anyway, themes and, and big cues from movies. Listen three times, right? Okay, you can listen to it once at full volume. I, now I'm going to turn it down. You can listen to it soft. And I'm going to turn it up again, even louder. You're going to listen to it again. Okay, now do you like it? <laughs> <laughs> sort of that thing. And and that's a kind of brilliant because a lot of times familiarity is what, sure. you know, mm-hmm. get, nice. gets you it used to something. It starts to get, mm-hmm. makes the hook. Yeah. yeah. Sets it. Wow, that's fascinating. It's a it's lot of he time. had talent and passion for it as well. And I feel like you really have to have that in order to have a successful career. Yeah, totally. Mm-hmm. It's just too, too much craziness, <laughs> you know, to, to not love it. Awesome. Well, I know we have we don't, we have a limited amount of time, but I gotta ask about the Wolfen Post. What was that? <laughs> 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 I just when I saw that, I went, "Well, well sure, it makes sense. I'm sure it's like, yeah, why not?" But you know, it's yeah, I know like, that's that's an the old. The guy that you scored Edge of Tomorrow was the director of the Wolfen Post. Uh, yeah. Um, so. By the way, I also scored Pitch Perfect. There you so, go. So yeah. There is some connection. Yeah, I forgot about that part. Yeah. Um, um, no, they're they're. Of by course, the way, did they come to you specifically? Because, no, they had oh, no idea. But when wow. I told them, they're like, "Whoa, that's great." <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, no, of, of course, it's a, a long-standing tradition. In fact, yeah. I was recently there, I don't know, four or five years ago for the 100th anniversary. Mm-hmm. Um, and there were like 800 of us who, still alive who all got together and sang. I mean, it was, it was, it was ridiculous mm-hmm. and amazing. Um, but that's, of course, uh, for those in your audience who don't know, that's uh, <laughs> a, a, a sort of – the Whiffin' Poofs are a very traditional, some would say stodgy – um, a cappella group mm-hmm. out of Yale of seniors only and it's kind of y- Yale is a big school for a cappella and there's yeah. 13, mm-hmm. 14 groups and then they're all feeder groups into the the, the kind of all-star group which is the Whiffin' Poofs yeah. um, which is only seniors yeah. and I, I'll tell you right now I was not uh, selected to be in that group for my singing ability. <laughs> Ironically enough, being the fact that it is a singing group, uh-huh. but basically I was the only one, you know, who could conduct. Who could arrange yeah. and conduct. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Uh-huh. You're like, ha-ha. Well, you carried that standard of that tradition very well. So congratulations on that. What's next for you? What are you working on now? What are you... I'm working on another time travel movie. Are you really? Hot Tub Time Machine 2. <laughs> All right. <laughs> nice. Not the one you were expecting. Yeah. They're going in the future this time, right? They do go. Am I allowed to say that? You just did. So, yeah, oh, they go into the future this Fine. time. You can blame that. Uh, she spoiler alert did. on Marissa. <laughs> My bad. She let it go. Um, so, it's, uh, it, yeah, it's different musically. I mean, the music is all... Um, first of all, the movie's ridiculous and silly and hilarious. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's nice to be able to do a bit of a, you know, they went to the 80s. There were some 80s influences in the score. Mm-hmm. Now they go to the future. So I could just sort of pretend what music whatever from the future yeah, might sound like. Be. So there's a lot of bleeps and bloops and, yeah. and sparkly mm-hmm. synthesizers. So you've already kind of got a hook into that or have you already done that? I'm, I'm recording next recording. week. I'm oh, just wow, about okay. done. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. How, 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 how long in this one? This was only like 
six weeks. Oh. This is nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Pretty short and sweet. Only yeah. about, again, about half the amount of music yeah. Yeah. as in Edge of Tomorrow. There's a lot of songs in these movies, mm -hmm. and every time there's a song, that means that's one the, piece of music yeah, I don't I have know. to write. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Did, do you have more animated features coming up? I do. Um, I can't really say what it is yet, oh. but there's, okay. a, there's a nice, really big one coming up for me uh, at the end of 2015. It's still very early. Nice. Okay. Um, and uh, a very exciting and daunting opportunity all at the same time. But wow. they, all, they all feel that way, of course. But you've yeah. kind of found slow discovery of love of animation, haven't you? Yes, I have. Uh, the experience of working on Frozen was really amazing. Um, and I think it comes from the fact that in live action, a lot of time, there's a, a bit of an us versus them with mm -hmm. the filmmakers in the studio. The studio wants one thing, filmmakers yeah. want another, especially directors who really believe in their vision. Mm -hmm. And it's maybe not what the studio wants, but they feel so passionate about it. They just want to defend it. And you know, I get kind of caught in the middle because, yeah. you know, it's a studio that hires me. Yep. And then my contract is with the studio, but it's the director who I, you're who working I have with to. Yeah, so yeah. It's, it's very difficult sometimes. Wow. Um, but... At Disney Animation, that company is run by a filmmaker, and all the people who direct films, they come out of that mm -hmm. organization. They start out as animators, not all, but most. They start out as animators, so um, they, they all come from a similar background. There's a kinship there, mm -hmm. and there's a, a real feeling of a team working mm -hmm. together to make something great instead of a battle. Right. Mm -hmm. And um, that is obviously uh, a great environment for someone like me to be yeah. able to, to do great work. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah. On, on top of that, you also did the Disney Paperman short animation. Right. Would you like to do more short animations too? I'll do anything with Disney that they call me for. In fact, I've done a, um, mm -hmm. I, I did something, another short for them. I don't know if it'll ever be released, but it was for um, a, a, a retailer's convention or maybe mm -hmm. their marketing department or something for for something they can show at uh, at conventions and ga mm -hmm. gatherings of international Disney people. I, I really was never quite sure what it was for. But it was this beautiful. They're always busy. They got lots of stuff to do. <laughs> it, it was this beautiful montage of all their animated films from their entire catalog, arranged in a very sweet way, and and there was no sound in it except for the music, which is similar to Paper Man. It's 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 you know it's three the three projects I've done for Disney have all have all felt like amazing opportunities for music. Two of them having no sound in them except for music. So it's hard for me not to have a soft place in my heart for them. I want to see well, that one. we're going to have to leave it there. We want to thank you so much for coming by thank and giving you. us your insight into this film and as well as the things you have coming up. We can't wait to see them. We hope to have you back when you when, when those opportunities arise. And, Anytime. Uh, you guys uh, are that's great. great. I appreciate it very much. We're going to take a quick break here while we uh, allow Christoph to head out, and then we'll come back and give our final thoughts of Edge of Tomorrow, and we'll see you soon.